You're listening to the First Baptist Rockdale Sunday Sermons Podcast. First Baptist Rockdale is a church dedicated to making disciples who make disciples. We hope you enjoy this week's message. Ecclesiastes can be kind of a downer of a book. Uh, if you have your Bible, it's about halfway through. After the book of Psalms and Proverbs, uh, you get to the book of Ecclesiastes, open to the middle, you're pretty close to where you need uh, to be. One of my friends texted me after last Sunday. Uh, he had problems with the kids during the service. He said, hey, uh, you preaching through Ecclesiastes even upset my children. And I said, well, that's okay. We're all going to be dead anyway soon, so don't worry about it. Right? That's some Ecclesiastes wisdom for you coming out. Ecclesiastes can kind of sit heavy like that. It can make you feel a little less than optimistic and cheery. Um, my hope is that uh, through every sermon that we have this summer through Ecclesiastes, you can find a little hope in the midst of the fact that this life that we're in right now is tough. Uh, this world is tough. This is not an easy uh, book. Sometimes we like to box things up and present the easy, prepackaged, nice view uh, of the world that we live in. But the reality of the world that we live in is that the world is difficult. It's tough. There are, there are things that perplex us. And if we think long enough and hard enough about it, we still don't have clarity. We still don't understand uh, why things are the way they are. And so the, the, the man who, who, who's writing and speaking through the book of Ecclesiastes uh, is going through and, and he says, I want to find fulfillment. I want to find pleasure. I want to find uh, some sort of happiness in our life. You know, our founding documents for our, for our country, right, guarantee the, the rise to life. Liberty in the pursuit of happiness. You notice how it's just the pursuit of happiness because happiness is a difficult thing to guarantee to people. It is a tough nut to crack. And this man was dealing with that pursuit of happiness, this pursuit of fulfillment, this pursuit of making sense of all of the things that were around him. And he had at his disposal everything. Everything that you could ever imagine, want, or desire, he had at his disposal. He could reach out and get it in a moment's notice. He had the wealth, he had the ability to get anything he wanted to make himself happy, to make himself fulfilled, and he still struggled to find it. How much harder it is for those of us who are worried about paying the mortgage, right? We're worried about paying our mortgage. And then we got to find happiness along the way, right? That's a, a tougher place to be. And if this guy who has everything struggles, how deep is the struggle for you and I? It's true. It's a tough thing. We'll pick up in verse 12 of chapter 1 of Ecclesiastes. And this is what is said. It says, I, the preacher, have been king over Israel and Jerusalem. And I applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. And it is an unhappy business that a God has given to the children of man to be busy with. I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity, a striving after the wind. What is crooked can't be made straight, and what is lacking cannot be counted. And I said in my heart, I have acquired great wisdom, surpassing all men who were over Jerusalem before me. And my heart has had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I applied my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. And I perceived that this also is just a striving after the wind. For in much wisdom is much vexation. And he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. The first place this man looked to find fulfillment in his life was wisdom. He, he turned to the books, the philosophers of yesteryear, the greatest minds. And he studied everything that he could study. He was a learned man, a wise man. In fact, he says he was wiser than all who came before him. That's a little arrogant, maybe. Um, but, but wisdom was not something that he was lacking. He was well-read. He was cultured. He understood the times, and he understood the best way to make sense of it. And at the end of all of that, he still said, this doesn't make sense. Right? Maybe you've maybe you experienced that in your life. Right, There was a time in your life when you were young and everything was simple. right? And there was like simple categories and boxes for things to sit in. And while uh, that was never true, in your mind it was true. right? That this was always the way this is going to be. And then you learned a little bit more about the world. You studied a little bit more. And those boxes that you had crafted and created to hold all the things that you understood, 
began to leak at the seams, right? This is always true, but this right here also is true. And, and it broke the barriers that you had, and you became distressed. I remember, I've shared this where I went to Houston Baptist University. My uh, freshman year, uh, I went through a crisis of faith. I was surrendered to the ministry uh, as a senior in high school. I uh, went into HBU knowing what God had called me to do. And I sat in a Christianity class, and they opened up the Bible, and they started talking about the Bible. They didn't, talk, they, didn't, they didn't talk what the Bible had to say. They talked around the Bible, right? And what I mean by that is like, like, here's the book that we have and we preach and we speak from, but now let's talk about everything else that isn't exactly in here. So what did this German theologian say about the formation of the book of Ecclesiastes, inclusion in the canon? Why is this word used instead of that word? I had a professor uh, basically uh, challenged to deny the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, right? And I'm sitting in class, and I'm like, how do you deny the virgin birth of Jesus Christ? It says it in the Bible. It's right there. And then he's like, well, this is actually, right? And that's what the, Well, actually, that's a dangerous sentence right there. Anything that comes after that's not great. Well, actually, here's da-da-da-da. And so I went through all of this stuff, and my boxes, which were nice and tidy, which, which some of you probably still have intact, which is like, if it's in the Bible, I believe it. Right, And that's a nice, tidy box. It's always been the box that I had had. It was the box I was raised with. If the Bible says it, then I believe it. And we're just going to have to deal with the fact that sometimes I don't like what it says. But if it's in there, I have to believe it. And all of a sudden, those boxes began to leak because I had a professor telling me, yeah, it's in the Bible, but it's not really in the Bible. Or that's lesser Bible than this or Bible. Right? And it became very challenging for my mind. And I experienced exactly what the author of Ecclesiastes experienced with great knowledge came great vexation. I was perplexed on how to deal with that. And I did. I dealt with it, right? I've worked through those issues. And honestly, I feel I'm better on the back end of this, having some of those struggles that I had to deal with as a 19-year-old so that I can stand here today and feel a little bit stronger when I say, you know, if God's word says it, I believe it. And this is why, right? And then when someone wants to say, yeah, but, at least I've dealt with most all of the yeah, buts that can be dealt with when it comes down to the Bible. But, you know, a seeking after wisdom, and we can do this in a lot of ways in our lives, will never lead to fulfillment. The purpose for your life, the grand, like, meaning for your life that you're seeking is never found in philosophy. It's not there. Right? It, it can get you closer. You might have some, some understanding of what it definitely can't be, or you may be able to knock some areas off, but it will never lead to fulfillment. It's an empty pursuit. That's what this man experiences, this Solomon-type person experienced, right? There was no fulfillment there. With more knowledge came more trouble, and it was a striving after the wind, right? I'm not saying don't, don't look for knowledge. In fact, I would encourage you to pursue knowledge, right? God is a God of truth, and where we find true things, we learn about God along the way. But if you have put all of your eggs in the, in, in the basics that you can understand and you can reason and you can logic your way into understanding God and God's purpose for your life and fulfillment, you will be disappointed. You'll be disappointed. Because there's no fulfillment in your logic. Right? Uh, pursue it. Explore it. But understand that if that's the only avenue you have, you're going to come up empty at the end of it. Right? You may be very learned, but not, not very fulfilled. So he continues on, starting in chapter 2. He said, I said in my heart, well, come, now I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. Knowledge didn't work, so let's seek pleasure. But behold, this was also vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad and of pleasure. What use is it? I searched my heart, how to cheer my body with wine, my heart still guiding me with wisdom, and how to lay a hold on folly. So I might see what was good for the children of man to do under heaven during the few days of their life. I made great works. I built houses. I planted vineyards for myself. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees. And I made myself pools from which uh, to water the forest of growing trees. And I bought male and female slaves and had slaves who were born in my house. And I had great possessions of herds and flocks more than anyone who had ever been before me in Jerusalem. And I gathered for myself silver and gold. And the treasure of kings and provinces. I got singers, men and women, and concubines to uh, uh, the delight of the sons of man. So I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. And my wisdom still remained with me. Whatever my eyes desired, I didn't keep from them. I kept my heart from no 
pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my work, and this was my reward for all my toil. And then I considered all that my hands had done, and all the toil that I had expended in doing it, and behold, all was vanity. And a strive came after the wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. After he explored wisdom and the limits of what the philosophers uh, had, had ever explored in, in understanding enjoyment of life, he turned his, his eyes uh, to pleasure. And this is kind of the American dream, right? That this, this dream of a pleasurable life, that you can find pleasure in everything. And so we have a limitless supply of pleasure. This man explored all of the things, you know, the drinking and the women and the building of great things and look at what I've done and everything that could be enjoyed, he had. Singers on command, right? Snap your fingers, you know, Billy Joel walks in and performs, piano man, snap your fingers, he leaves, right? And someone else walks in again, right? He was uh, ultimate authority. Everything that you would say, like if you can have all of this all day long, you must be happy. Right, if you can have all of the good and none of the bad, you must be happy. You must be fulfilled. You must, at the end of that day of pleasure, sit back and say, now I'm satisfied with life. I know what it's like to experience joy. And this man, after going through all of those things, says it wasn't actually real. Right? Pleasure is a fleeting experience. The things that you enjoy, whatever it is, is a fleeting experience. It may bring you some, some, some break from the, 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 the drudgery of our life, but it never was intended to satisfy you, right? I liken it to cotton candy, right? You go to a baseball game, you get cotton candy, it's massive, right? Bigger than your face, and you grab a hold of it, and you're like, this is going to be it. And you put it in your mouth, and it's gone, just like that. You don't chew it, you don't digest it, it just disappears in your mouth, as if it never were, except for the little like sticky parts that stick on your fingers for the better part of a month, right? Everything that goes in you disappears. That's what pleasure is, right? It looks good, it looks fulfilling, and for a moment in, in your mouth, it may be a delight for a second, but then it's gone, and you're left with a sticky residue that you can't get off of you, right? It doesn't actually satisfy. And everything tells you that it will. The entire American economy right now tells you that your pursuit of stuff will make you happy. Buy another thing. That's a Madison Avenue's whole deal. Buy another thing. Get a newer car, right? Get a better house. Take a better vacation than your Instagram friend because if you get their vacation plus all access to the uh, whatever super sweet bungalow with the, you know, the glass bottom where the fish swim under you, then you'll experience happiness. But it's fleeting. It comes and it goes because, guys, God made life to have pleasurable moments, but life is not about seeking your pleasure. It's not. And that's the great lie that we have all bought into to some degree or another. That another thing, another widget, another trip, another boy, another girl, another relationship will make us happy. This is why, this is why people run around on their spouses, by the way. Right? We think if they're, they're, like, this one isn't quite doing it for me anymore or for this season, but that lady or that man will. And so I'm going to leave this person secretly because like, they may be the parent of my children. I'm going to leave this person. I'm going to pursue after pleasure over here. And I'm going to tell you something. It's empty. It may seem real. It may seem fulfilling for a season. But it will, it will not last. It just doesn't work that way. Because you were not created. right? Your ultimate purpose isn't to feed the appetites that, that you have inside of you. God has given you these appetites. They are good Things. There are ways for you to experience a little bit of the goodness of God, but if you corrupt them and you make it all about feeding those appetites, uh, whether it's uh, wealth or sex or entertainment or travel or possessions, whatever it is that you fill in that gap and you say that will be the thing that I'm going to pursue wholeheartedly, it will leave you empty at the end. Some of us work really hard to build up retirement funds and we can make those retirement funds into our idols. 
We think, I'm going to put all of this away. I'm going to store all of this away. But at the end of the, whenever we, we go and our life is no more, we die with more money than we ever spent. Right? And, and we did nothing with it to benefit those who God has put around us. Pleasure ultimately doesn't lead to fulfillment. The pursuit of pleasure doesn't lead to fulfillment. Don't buy the lies that you see on television. Right? That you will be better looking uh, faster running, you know, more satisfied if you would buy, do, or consume X, Y, or Z. It's all a lie. There are people paid seven figures a year to figure out how to lie to you to get you to buy the thing that they themselves won't buy at all. That's one of the, one of the great, great things about social media, right? The people who, are, who sell you social media, and they're on it, and they're pitching it, and they're, they avoid that in every way they can for themselves. Right? Because it's addictive, and it's damaging, and they see it, and they walk away. Don't buy the lies that are out there. Pleasure fails to deliver fulfillment. Continuing on in verse 12, it says, So I turn to consider wisdom and madness and folly, for what can man do, uh, or what can the man do who comes after the king, the, the, the generation to come, only what's already been done. And I saw there's more gain in wisdom than folly, and there's more gain in light than in darkness. The wise person has his eyes in his head, and the fool walks in darkness. Yet I perceive that the same event happens to all of them. And I said in my heart, what happens to the fool will happen to me also. Why then have I been so very wise? For of the wise, as of the fool, there is no enduring remember, seeing, remember it, seeing that in the days to come, all who, who will have been long forgotten. Uh, all, how the wise dies just like the fool. So I hated life because what is done under the sun was gr grievous to me. For all is vanity and a striving after the wind. I hated all my toil in which I toil under the sun. Seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be wise or a fool. Yet he will be master of all for which I toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This also... Is vanity. So I turned about and I gave my heart up to despair over all the toils and my labors under the sun because sometimes a person has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave everything to be enjoyed by someone who didn't toil for it at all. This also is vanity and a great evil. Uh, for what has a man from which all the toil and striving of heart with which he toils beneath the sun? For all his days are full of sorrow, his work is a vexation, and even in the night his heart doesn't rest. This also is vanity. That's a real upper there. Basically what he says is this, look, one day, no matter how hard you work, no matter how wise you are, no matter how, 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 how uh, awesome you are, at the end of your life, you will be no more. And whatever you have gets passed on to someone after you who didn't work for it. And oftentimes, they're worthless. Right? Not your kids. Your kids are all wonderful, excellent people, I'm sure. Right? But, right, yeah, you've seen studies of these people who come into great wealth and then, like, three generations later, this, like, massive amount of wealth is totally gone, right? Because the people who didn't work for that wealth, who were just kind of, like, born with the right last name, they don't understand it. And so they just spend and spend and spend. They don't put anything into it. And the wise who put the stuff away ends up leaving all of that for the fool who's behind them. And, and Solomon, this Solomon guy, says, man, what a great waste that is. I spend my whole life building and planting and doing all these things, and the people who are coming after me, they're, they're, they're stupid, idiots. They're going to waste it all, right? And maybe a fear of yours. My parents have told me uh, on numerous occasions that they're spending every dollar they make, right? That's their goal. Their goal is whenever they clock out to be given the last dollar to the undertaker on the way out. Okay, that's their goal so that we don't end up with anything from them. I'm okay with that. I really am. I'm glad they told me that, by the way, as well. That would have been kind of disappointing otherwise, maybe. Right, but the idea is, like, they're not going to worry about passing things on because ultimately, like, that's not their purpose. My parents raised me. They set me up. They, they directed me in a way uh, to, in which I should go. And my job is not to live off of them for eternity or my kids or, their, or, their, or my brother's kids, right? Ultimately, my job is to make my own path. But, you know, nothing that we do in this life is permanent. That's a, that's a tough thing to, 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 to stomach, 
nothing that we do. Is, I talked about it last week, right? Right. Like ultimately, like you're one day you're going to come and you're going to turn into a, a spot on the ground somewhere, maybe a, a stone that marks you, and give a few generations away, and your name may be illegible on that rock that you put there. Sand, the wind has slowly worn it away. And there's a marker that someone was here, but we can't even identify who that was anymore. Right? Your life is temporary, and nothing that you do makes ultimate, lasting impact under the sun. None of the work that you toil for, none of the money you save for your company, none of the, none, none of the, none of the lives that you've you know, worked with throughout your life, ultimately, like in the ultimate grand scheme, it all just washes away. Right, and that's, it. and that's tough to hear because we like to think that what we do matters. It does, by the way, to some degree, today. We like to think that it has this lasting impact for forever. But you know, the human history, all of human history, the billions of people who have lived, there's not many people from over like, I don't know, 300 years ago that we know anything about. Right, they've pretty much all been washed away by history. These were important people, fathers, mothers, grandparents, uh, leaders in their communities, right? Educators, important people. But through the sands of time, they have washed away. And that can lead to despair. That knowledge right there, that if 95% or 99% of everybody who's ever lived has, has been washed away by the sands of time, what about you? Can lead to despair. But we don't want to stay there. We'll continue down and verse 24 it says, There's nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This, is all, this also I saw is from the hand of God. For apart from him, who can eat or have enjoyment? For to the one who pleases him, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to sinner, he has given the business of gathering and collecting, only to give to the one who pleases God. This also is a vanity and a striving after the wind. And, and so here's the point. Uh, that they want you to drive from all of this despair, that pleasure won't get you there, wisdom won't get you there, and nothing really stays forever. It's, it's, it's in this moment that you're in right now. This moment right now, 2021, 20, May the 20-something. I don't know what day it is. Or 26, maybe? I don't know. I don't know what day it is. 25th? 3rd? I was close. I was going to get there eventually. Right? I'm taking it, It's like an auction, but the wrong direction. Right, May the 23rd, 2021, this moment right here, your, your best path forward is to find enjoyment in the work God has put before you today. Not to, not to fret about what, you, what it could be, what the impact might be, what things weren't in your past or what things may be in your future, but in this moment right now, where you sit, whatever that is, whether you're retired or you're a young family trying to figure a life out, Right? Whether, whether you're done with, with your 9 to 5 job or you're in your 9 to 5 job, whatever it is that God has placed you to be doing right now, to find enjoyment there now. Right? God has given you work to do. There is a work greater than the work that you're paid to do, which is the work that God has called you to be about. While all the stuff under the sun passes away, all the stuff underneath the sun comes and goes, that above the sun perspective that we talked about last week, if you would live with some work in that mind, you have a lasting impact that brings you present joy and fulfillment. You can find fulfillment today in the work that God has put before you. Whether that's having meaningful conversations with your friends while you're enjoying time together, uh, or, 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 or you're attending church and you're serving God in the midst that God has put you there. You need to find an area where your service to God is active today. And then find joy in that service. You know, not everyone, we're, we're recruiting children's workers right now. We need people to help with Kid Jam. We got a pile of kids upstairs right now doing that uh, with a couple of adults. We're recruiting, uh, we need nursery workers because some of y'all been having babies, right? I won't talk about how that went about happening, but, but some of y'all been having babies. And so our nursery is getting full which is a wonderful problem to have, but we need help in the nursery. We need children's Sunday school teachers. We're having kids going to Sunday school. We need workers uh, to be there, right? But not everyone needs to work with children. I don't need to work with children. My children, maybe, sometimes. But your children, almost certainly not. 
And it's not that I don't love your children. I do. I love your kids. They're wonderful joys to see. But you don't want me doing that job. I've shared it before. I'll share it again. I was at an event that we did here in the gym. Uh, and there was this kid. And, and, like, I don't know what the deal with that kid is. Uh, but we were trying to gather them together to do, like, a thing, a game, something fun for the kids. And I used to be a youth pastor, and I'm good with teenagers. I really am, because teenagers you can be a little bit rude with and it not be child abuse, okay? Um, and so, like, and so like I, I was talking to this, this the, trying to get them all together. Guys, let's da 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 And this kid, just, 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 I'm like, God, be quiet. Well, just, just, just. I'm like, you need to stop, or I'm going to wear you out. This is someone else's kid, by the way. You're not allowed to wear out other people's kids, I've been told. Um, right? I'm going to wear you out. I tell my kids that sometimes, and then I have to go through with it, which is fun for everybody, right? And so this kid looks at me, and he's like, what does it mean to wear me out? And I just about lost my mind. I was like, I'm going to have to show you, right? I'm not meant to work with other people's children. I'm not. I'm just not, because like, I couldn't, I, 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 school teachers, God bless y'all. I, I think I would get fired. I love Jesus. I think I would get fired. I don't think I could make it. A week. I would say something, and it would be a mama would come in to the administrator, and they'd be like, did you say this? And I'd be like, sounds worse when you say it back to me, but yeah, I did. <laughs> right? Like, I just couldn't do it. Not everyone's supposed to do everything. Find a spot where you can serve the Lord, where you can be serving God. That brings you joy. And in those moments, you'll find meaning and fulfillment. Guys, if you want to find fulfillment in your life, if you're trying to figure out what's the purpose for this life, where there's happiness and joy, there is happiness, there's fulfillment, there's satisfaction in serving God in the right place. So discover what that is. If you're alive today, which if you're hearing me, you are, congratulations, right? <laughs> Somebody, I say, say, how you doing? I said, I'm still kicking. I said, that's pretty good. I'll take still kicking over the alternative some days. If you're still alive and kicking, you've got something to give for the Lord today. That can be in this church. That can be in your community. It can be at Place of Hope. It can be in just in prayer, getting on your knees or in your room and praying for you. I have, I have a dear woman in our church prays for me every single day. Every single day. That's what she does. Every day she goes to God. She prays for your pastor. Can you imagine how terrible I would be if that did not happen? I need it. I need it. So whatever it is, if you want to find fulfillment in this life, don't seek pleasure, don't seek knowledge, don't seek wisdom. They're, those are empty, dead ends. There is purpose, fulfillment in serving God in the work that you have today. Find joy in the work that God has put before you today. Some of you, that means you need to be working with children, by the way. Because we have needs for that in this church. And we have a spot for you. And you think, man, I used to work with kids because I used to be a school teacher. But I don't know, kids these days. Some of you, grandmas and grandpas, man, we need you back there rocking little babies. I promise you, if you go work in the nursery, if you get on a rotation working with the nursery, you won't have to change one diaper. We pay someone to change diapers. You won't have to change one diaper. You can just hold those cute little babies while they, while they sleep in your arms. I like to picture them that way and not the other way where they're just screaming at you inconsolable, okay? That's possible too, right? But some of you need to get involved in that. Some of you need to sign up for work in vacation Bible school. And in that work, you can find purpose and pleasure. God has a purpose for your life, and that's found through serving him in a variety of ways, outside of this church as well, but a variety of ways where you can serve God and do work for his kingdom. Let me pray.